doctors of reddit what patient made you go how are you even alive part one a belligerent guy comes in in a wheelchair he doesn't want to be here he's fine the party was good ems messed his evening up ems brought him in from a bush party the guy had a chainsaw stuck in his thigh and shin literally jammed in his leg and severe burns after falling into the bonfire on half his body the guy was hammered didn't seem bothered by the fact that he was severely burned or had a chainsaw in his leg he ended up losing the leg below his knee and got a nasty infection from the burn but still if his leg wasn't completely screwed i'm convinced he'd have gotten up and tried to fight people i was on home call for er in a small town i got a call from the er nurse one night and she was like ems brought someone in here and they think she might be dead i was like well is she she was like i don't know this was a seasoned rn by the way so i was like well guess we're treating this as a code blue kind of situation so without any further information i jump into my car and rush over to the hospital once i got there i realized why the triage nurse was so confused in the trauma bay lay what appeared to be skeletonized remains under a blanket the person felt warm to touch so i opened their eye and a yellow wrinkled shrunken eyeball stared at me and then suddenly moved the potassium of 1 for those familiar with lab values the back story was extreme self neglect or depression combined with caregiver neglect weighed in at 67 pounds at a height of about 5 foot 5 we actually resuscitated her very aggressively and unbelievably after about 8 liters of fluid she started speaking a word or two at a time and recognized her daughter I have a hospice patient that has been on our service for 4 years. I'm either really great at the hospice or really bad at it. My great grandma went to hospice because she was no longer ambulatory, needed help using the restroom, losing weight, etc. A month in, her nurse comes in to find her in the restroom on her own steam. This was paired with a marked weight gain. Turns out the nursing home food was garbage, so she wasn't eating enough. but the hospice facility let her have salty buttery pierogi and kielbasa again so she started eating my father's doctor couldn't believe a he didn't need to amputate his feet and b he was still alive dad had brittle diabetes his pancreas would kick in and out due to a congenital deformity at 82 he had significant heart issues including angina enlarged heart and clogged arteries One day his feet went black not just bluish or gray black as charcoal rushed to emergency we were told they would amputate but to say our goodbyes dad refused surgery said he'd rather be dead at his age hours later his feet were pink we took him home that morning the doctor actually apologized for upsetting us but said he'd never seen anything like it wow the dude just straight up refused to die and his body was like All right, jeez, you win. Veterinarian, dog hit by a train. It severed the dog's leg, and the dog carried its own leg home. The owner brought dog and leg to the ER. That dog must have been crazy from pain. That's amazing. Did it survive? I'm assuming that the leg wasn't reattached and now there's a three-legged dog being absolutely doted on somewhere in the world. I had a patient who was literally cut in half at the pelvis after a car hit him and pinned him to a telephone pole. Paramedics carried his leg separately. He was wide awake and talking to me as we quickly put in a central line and he got all the bleeders like gated by like five different surgeons. He declined pain meds repeatedly. What a legend. He was in the OR 5 minutes later. Luckily this was at a major academic center with an exceptional trauma surgery team. Apparently the guy lived. I'm not sure what his quality of life was after, but pretty crazy. Currently in residency, but this was a patient I saw in medical school. This one has more to do with a patient's past medical history instead of anything acute. I had one patient in one of my internal medicine rotations who was admitted for hip surgery, who was one of the nicest, sweetest people I've ever met. Her surgery was pretty routine and there were no complications. 
In her past medical history, she was diagnosed with stage 4 endometrial cancer that had spread to her brain. Apparently, she had undergone chemo, radiation, primary tumor resection, and surgery to remove the brain met. She remained cancer-free since that period. The fact that she had undergone that whole ordeal and appeared to be mostly healthy and was in remission from her cancer really blew my mind. During residency, my ICU patient had to have his chest reopened less than an hour after a six-hour open-heart CABG surgery. He needed 12 units of blood, his heart massaged, then shocked four times. Cardiothoracic surgeon in the ICU operating because no time to go back down to OR was an illicit drug abuser and alcoholic. Nurses called him the cockroach. I checked in on him for four weeks. He was unresponsive every day. On week two, we had to consult ENT to take maggots out of his nose. I was sure he was a goner after that. Week three passed with no change. Week four, day 24, I believe, at 6 a.m., he opens his eyes. I was shocked. He has a permanent track anostomy now, but somehow is alive. A couple pictures of me before and after brain surgery were on the front page around this time last year. The mortality rate for acute subdural hematosis is 50 to 90 percent. Of those who live, approximately 20 to 30 percent regain any brain functioning. Due to the subdural hematoma, the bleeding in my skull was so severe that I also had cranial herniation. My brain tilted 5 millimeters, causing my brain stem to compress into my spinal cord. That I not only lived, but woke up and recovered well enough to go back to work, get married, travel the world, return to baseline physically is a straight up medical miracle. I'm still in touch with the neurosurgeon who was on call at the hospital that day and he says the same thing. Lady in her mid-30s was in the clinic for one week follow up post foot amputation diabetes. She was admitted straight from the clinic because her blood glucose was 600 milligrams per DL and normal is 80 to 120 and the wound was severely infected. We used super concentrated doses of insulin to bring it back to the 200s. She was on strict diet restrictions and we couldn't figure out how it wouldn't drop any lower than 250. It turns out her kids, teens, had been sneaking giant 64 ounce sodas and candy bars into the hospital, literally one week after we chopped her foot off because of uncontrolled diabetes. Not exactly a case of how did you survive that trauma disease, but how do you even function on your own? I work in trauma and once had a guy fall off a roof. He said he remembered hitting the bars on the scaffolding on the way down. We originally thought he'd fractured his femur, but nope, just a small hematoma. He was in bed next to a man who had broken his ribs and had a small C-spine fracture when he fell forward picking up his keys. As a med student on my emergency rotation, I had a guy brought in who had fallen off a 7th or 8th floor balcony and landed on his head. Essentially DOA and we couldn't get a blood pressure when he got to the hospital. As a student, my job was to basically stand to the side and squeeze the bazillion bags of blood that went into this dude. His cervical spine was essentially dust on the initial CT scan we got. I figured he probably wouldn't have made it, but about a month later, I'm now in my ICU rotation and I see this guy awake and conscious. It's pretty crazy. Not a doctor, but I had a few doctors ask me that. It typically, if you get appendicitis, it'll rupture and sepsis will set in within a day or so. And when that happens, it gets real bad real fast. So I got appendicitis. It freaking hurt so badly, but I didn't know I had appendicitis. I went to the doctor. He couldn't tell what was going on. He thought I had a compacted stool and wanted me to take stool softeners. So I did. It didn't help because, spoiler, it was appendicitis, right? And then a roommate who thinks he knows what he's talking about tells me that it's all in my head and I just need to physically get off the couch and exercise because he feels much better after the exercises. Okay, dude, I can't even get off the couch to use the restroom without almost passing out in pain. He tells me to just play a video game to get my mind off of it. I go to class, grad student at the time. I call the doctor and make another appointment. He doesn't know what's going on. I talk with another doctor, no clue. 
He thought maybe it's appendicitis, but I didn't have a fever and didn't have a recoil pain. So maybe it was gastrointestinal stuff. So I schedule an appointment, meet with them. All the while I'm going to class and taking the maximum dosage of all pain relievers I can get my hands on. And finally, finally, the GI doctor's scan showed that I had appendicitis. Hooray! I go to the nearest ER and I say, in a totally calm tone, Hi, my name is, insert name here. So my doctor said I should probably go to the ER because my appendix burst a while ago and it should probably be taken out or something. Turns out my appendix burst and I held on to it for three and a half weeks. I had a dozen doctors come in and some of them even started by saying, Hello, my name is Dr. Such and Such and I heard that you're the guy who has had a burst appendix for nearly a month and you're still alive. I'm not on your case, but I just wanted to meet you. How the hell are you still alive? How the hell did you drive yourself here and just waltz into our ER? I got that alien bioengineering upgrade where the abdomen moves around and the wall seals off the burst appendix so it doesn't leak everywhere. Currently a med student, but was formerly an ER nurse. While working as a nurse, I had this one patient who was originally from the Congo, complaining of right lower abdominal pain with a subsequent diagnosis of appendicitis. Nothing crazy about that, I see it every day. The crazy part was the story he told me next. He said that he didn't think it could be appendicitis. And when I asked him why, he told me this. When he was in the Congo, he was out in the bush trying to poach gorillas. Awful, I know. When he developed right lower abdominal pain, nausea, fever, etc. Being out in the bush, far from medical attention, he and his buddy decided the best course of action was to cut open his abdomen with the machete and remove his own appendix. After nearly dying from the surgery, he then went on to nearly dying from sepsis over the next several weeks. I assume he was under medical care by this point. Somehow he manages to overcome nearly impossible odds and survives, and years later immigrated to Canada where he develops appendicitis again. And so after hearing this, I was equally amazed as well as skeptical, but he showed me his scar which I thought was fairly validating. I told his surgeon the story and asked why would he still get appendicitis, and they said he most likely just didn't remove the whole thing. I know this is all hearsay, and it is definitely possible it was exaggerated or even entirely fabricated by the patient. But if it's true, it's one of the most badass things I have ever heard and definitely belongs here.